Over a week ago, news broke that the U.S. government had been hacked by what appeared to be Russian intelligence. A week later, the list of affected agencies and private companies has grown. Experts say the hackers may have been seeking nuclear secrets, blueprints for advanced weaponry, and COVID-19 vaccine-related research. Now, Trump has claimed without evidence that China is to blame. And in this episode, we're just going to talk about the hack, how the U.S. should deal with it, and why Trump's blind spot towards Russia seems to continue. What is up, Drew? Uh, last last episode before the holidays. How's everything treating you, man? Good. We were talking a little bit about it before the podcast. Kind of just finished up some Christmas shopping. About to go on a little break with work. Um, just looking forward to it. I'm hoping I can just like kick back, maybe eat some sweets. And uh, just, you know, enjoy the holidays. Um, it's been a long friggin' year. You, uh, everyone out there doesn't need me to tell them that. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm looking forward to a little break. But um, unfortunately, <laughs> our, our, you, our government and 18,000 other private businesses got hacked by the Russians right before the break. So we're, we're talking about that. Yeah, it's uh, a <laughs> I, I think like just to start off with this. I think the shocking part of it is the scope of it and just how long it's been going on until we realized, you know, um, I think I'm, I'm just looking at this New York times article that did a pretty good job of having a good background on this. And they say the, the malware was planted back in March in a software update that was from a tech company called solar winds and it has private sector and government contracts. So it's kind of this all encompassing umbrella. And there's around 18,000 of the company's clients who actually downloaded the malware. And, you know, there's a lot more we could get into, but that's just kind of the, the interesting part is that this was a wide reaching hack. Yeah. And, but I, but I do want to just say off the beginning is that though the hack did affect, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of people, it does seem like they weren't trying to get quantity. They were trying to get quality, but by spreading that octopus out wide and far, it was easier to get the things they wanted. Like, I don't think they really cared about some private companies like banking records. To me, it seems probably it was more nefarious, but they just were able to gain so much access that the more you spread that net, the more you're likely to catch something, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we both took a listen to you know the NPR's little bit about it and how they, you know, they talked to a strategic studies expert from John Hopkins University and how basically he said exactly what you're saying, right? So this was a very well coordinated attack um, targeting like government agencies at the highest level um, using you know using well designed hacks that were they were able to cover their tracks, right? And so mm -hmm. basically. Because it is important to get into these details because, first of all, like hacking, like a lot of people don't even know what the hell hacking is, right? Um, and I also think that we, we, we get, like we hear about a big hack every couple of months. And, and, and I think we need to get into why this is different, right? This is different than, you know, uh, the Ashley Madison hack where it was like people's credit card info. You know, 10, like, you know, 10 million dudes that wanted to cheat on their wives, their credit card info come out, right? You know, that's obviously like, you know, oh man, that's big news, right? But that that was more about like financial gain and that private company had a security problem. This is like a, a very strategic and targeted attack that seems to be from an intelligence agency and everything we know looks makes it look like it's the Russian intelligence agency, SVP, that was targeting um, uh, high government agencies using that solar winds update, right? This was not a phishing scandal, right? You know, your typical thing where it's like, hey, I'm pretending to be a Microsoft support guy. Click on this link. We, we need to give you an update, right? That's like how, like, you know, old boomers get hacked and lose their email accounts is because they click on dumb crap in their, in their email. <laughs> this is not that. This is way more advanced. This is not like a simple phishing scam. So what I'm hearing is that last week it has like, it, it looks like a Russian hack. It acts like a Russian hack. It's advanced. It's targeting, like you said, government information, not money, not anything like that, like government information. Um, and it was wide reaching and it was, you know, and, and, and it has a lot of people concerned. I mean, Democratic senators have said things like this is should be viewed as an act of war from Russia. Um, you know, Mitt Romney says it's a massive blind spot. Um, so, you know, across the aisle, this is serious. Um, and strangely, there's not much response from the White House. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't think it's strange personally, but you know, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. But yeah. I think you did do a really good job of saying that this is not a typical hack. And I feel like we've kind of become immune to what Russian hacking even like stands for, you know, and I'll, I'll never forget. I think it was three, four years ago. Now I was in Italy in a small hostel and I, I, I met a really nice Russian guy and we ended up having some beers and just talking about Russian politics, actually. And he actually turned out to be in a, a, a software engineer out of Russia and he was actually living in Europe in exile and he'd been traveling around and he, he was talking about, you know, like these troll farms and all that type of stuff and where he actually was involved in a troll farm, uh, troll farm outside of St. Petersburg at the time. And he just talked about how Dang. they didn't really care. There was nothing super nefarious in these. It was, it was just basically spreading false information. Right. right. And so I, I think a lot of people, when they think of Russian hacking, they think more of the idea of maybe hacking our social media or our collective ideology of like politics inside of the country. You know, I, I think that's what 2016 was, was that was just, you know, okay, Black Lives Matter and, you know, Proud Boys memes going around to just anger the base. And this is not that, like you like you said very well. And the irony of it was I was reading that New York Times article describing this, and they actually said that their own company was using solar winds and they were hacked themselves. Right. And I think that's that shows the scope of this. Um, in that New York Times article, it says nearly all four, Fortune 500 companies, including the New York Times, and Los Alamos National Laboratory were hacked. And that's the scary thing to me to kind of go back to what you were saying is that it doesn't seem like they want money. It doesn't seem like they want to sow like political discord, like the, you know, 2016, like Hillary Trump stuff. This seems to be more nefarious. But to me, the scariest thing is, is no one knows what they want or why they're doing it. And, and I mean, when you when you say stuff like you know they've hacked Boeing nuclear weapon or I mean I mean our Alamos lab which has the information with the nuclear weapons all this type of stuff vaccine research, I was just reading today that Russia is behind in vaccine research like they're putting out these sketchy vaccines that haven't even got to you know stage three trials so what do they want I'm just curious you know, yeah and I think the kind of thing is like again again I am no I am by no means a cybersecurity expert I'm going off of what I'm what I'm reading from other experts which is you know how you gain information. Um, and so what I'm getting from other experts is that, you know, they, they understood that they were, they were covering up their tracks, like the way that they were hacking into these systems, getting into the department of Homeland security, the department of defense, the department of the treasury, right? They were able to get in and get information and, and leave. And unlike, unlike, you know, normal theft, like the, I think one of the experts made the, um, the allegory of like, you know, they have a, a key to 8,000 homes, but they're only going for the big mansions. Well, to take that even further, it's tough to know exactly <laughs> what they're going for because when you steal from a mansion, you know, you steal the painting, it's gone. But in hacking, you know, you can make a copy and go. Like, you don't have to like, you know, it's not like a hack, they just come in and destroy everything and leave. Like, you can, you, that's why it took so long to find is because for months, it didn't look like anything had happened. So as far as pinning down exactly what they were targeting, that's probably going to be kind of tough because you may not know, like everything looks fine. Like you could come home and like, well, the, the vase is still there. The painting's still there. The fireplace is still there, but really they hacked everything, took a copy and left. So I, I think that, you know, but w so the, the exact details of what exactly they wanted, whether it's, you know, a, a vaccine information, um, Boeing plane information, whatever. We don't know that, but we do know that it looks like it was targeting U.S. government agencies. So it's not like a private group trying to, you know, steal some money. It seems like it's nation state espionage, right? And we should treat it as such. Um, and that kind of makes things a little murky because, you know, we engage in espionage. China engages in espionage. Everybody engages in espionage in one degree or another. But obviously, Russia, China, and the United States, I would say the other f on the five hand, like Australia, France, Germany, we're all engaging in espionage like this. It's just, you know, the Amer United States doesn't want to be the victim of it. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and frankly, you know, we, we were just embarrassed on the world stage because this is a huge hack. Now, I'm sure we've done the same thing to maybe smaller nations or or similar kind of intrusions into, you know, government systems. Um, but like, you know, if everyone's doing espionage, man, we better be better at it because we're obviously sucking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that's kind of the bitter, bittersweet irony of this to a certain extent is that 
yeah, like you said, everyone's doing this. And the U.S. has especially been doing this in Eastern Europe for a long time. So, <laughs> like, obviously, this is scary as an like to me as an American citizen, knowing that our government is pretty much so open to hacking like this. But then again, at the end of the day, like, it is it is muddy out there and it's convoluted out there when you really think about cyber hacking and what nations actually do. I mean, you and I've talked about the NSA and other U.S. agencies, you know, the do digital espionage. And OK, that's a different word. Hacking, digital espionage, whatever you want to call them, they're all doing somewhat of the same thing. And so I like my my big takeaway to a certain extent is that I think we need to have some form of a like multilateral treaty or organization that actually not only holds maybe bad actors accountable if they do something like this, but also has us agree on kind of what the playing field is supposed to be. Because I don't think right now most of the world even understands like what is the threat, who is doing it and what do they want. And so I think we need to bring countries together to at least like draw a line on what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, you know, because right now, I mean, the problem is, is that it's really hard like, you know, back in the day, like I was, uh, let me see, I, I have it here. There was a really interesting article that was called Cyber Threats Call for Cyber Democracy or Diplomacy, sorry. And it was talking about how a lot of ex national, my national security experts, national espionage experts, cyber attack experts all talk about how basically deterrence is their method for cyber war because it worked during the Cold War during, you know, the, the nuclear age. Right. And, and, and they seem to find that deterrence hasn't really worked because it's made the playing field chaos. It's made it just, you know, an arena of different actors with different motives. And, and so it almost has come to culmination with this because we can't 100% prove it was, you know, actual Russian government officials, though the signs point that way. And also we don't know what they did and we don't really know what are appropriate response is. And we don't know how to stop them from doing this further. And so my solution would be at least we need to talk with other nations and know what the next step is. Now, I don't actually honestly know how that works because I'm not a cyber expert either, but I don't think deterrence and just saying, well, we're not going to take out your grid if you don't take out our grid or we're not going to hack your, you know, your Federal Reserve if you don't hack our giant bank. I don't think that's going to work anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think that's an interesting point. Like, you know, we've seen a world where, you know, we, we assume that we haven't used a second bomb because of mutually assured destruction but does do, does cyber hacking carry that same weight right like you know if you start throwing nukes around it's guaranteed that like the response will be like you know global destruction or at least your entire population's gone but i don't think that same like risk is associated with cyber hacks um you know what i mean so I, maybe you're right maybe that kind of deterrence and, and and mutually assured destruction theory doesn't apply here i mean obviously russia is willing to do things like this in broad daylight basically and again i'm only going off of the information we've gotten within one week that's public but based on what i know is i mean senators and, and others i mean bill barr has access to information that we don't and he says it's most likely to be russians right so you know people that have access to better and more information than we do are saying it's 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 Russia. It looks like mm -hmm. a duck. It talks like a duck. It acts like a duck. It's a duck. Yet strangely, our president seems to think it's a goose. Um, <laughs> he, he says he says it's he says it's maybe China. It doesn't seem like it's Russia, and it's overplayed. It's like no, or, or the media is, is is over like you know up up playing how important this hack is. And I'm like, I don't think so, man. Like cybersecurity experts are saying this is a big freaking deal. Um, now, you know why is Trump doing that? I don't know. Kind of weird. He's kind of for someone who claims to be so tough on Russia. He seems to kind of not give a crap when Russia has bounties against our soldiers and Russia engages in cyber espionage in broad daylight. However, now let's go on to the guy who is going to be president. Biden has said that without much detail that that will be, you know, there's going to be a response. There's going to be consequences. I think that what your your idea is 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 valid. Like, I think one is I mean, just I'm always a proponent of international cooperation i don't think that if we had some kind of like un committee or treaty i'm not sure how much that would do you know because i feel like and, and i think that the um the guy from john hopkins the security expert mentioned this as well is that you know russia and china can very easily say one thing on, 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 to the public and do something in private uh the, the united states has done that but doesn't have as much of that luxury right like they're more like the united states just by definition and our government is more 
like responsible and has to respond to its public, whereas China can just kind of do what it wants. So, you know, having that agreement, like an international agreement saying like, hey, we won't cross these lines as far as like shutting down grids and stuff. On paper, it sounds good. Maybe I, I really think that China and Russia would just sign it and not give a crap. Um, <laughs> you know, so I think that like one thing we do is like hit them back. You know what I mean? Like if, if Russia is willing to do this in broad daylight and they are willing to do many things in broad daylight, like annex Crimea, like when when do we draw the line? We, we should hit them back and not obviously you don't say that. Maybe, you know, do what Biden's doing. Say so it's like, you know, there will be a response. And a year down the line, boom, some oligarch just got all his finances washed or whatever. Like, I don't know. But I, I honestly think like this is the the mil this is the warfare of the future. And to just kind of like roll over and say that eh, maybe it's not Russia is just stupid. It's weak. <laughs> it's cowardly. I say hit him back. <clears throat> Yeah, I okay. A couple things here. So first, with Trump, I, I agree with you that I think it's ridiculous that he is just unable to condemn Russia in this case. I think that's one of the biggest, long-lasting mysteries of Trump and his presidency is the Russia connection. There's something there. There's something there. I don't know if it's super strong or just some loose connection, but there's something there. And I don't know if we'll ever know. That could just be that giant mystery that never gets answered. Um, ironically, though. <laughs> One of the groups that was targeted by Russian hackers, Russian hackers, given that it holds up, was the Commerce Department's National Telecommunications and Information Administration, and also was the Department of Homeland Security, whose Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency oversaw the defense of our election last month. And so it's interesting, because if I was Trump, and I'm still trying to fight Biden being president, I'm just putting my Trump hat on for a minute. I'm just thinking, sure, sure. you know, MAGA, MAGA for a moment. Okay, let's point the finger at Russia and say this election was actually fraudulent because there were Russian, there was literally malware hacking the cybersecurity department of the Pentagon that deals with election security. I think that would be a pretty interesting argument to make. Obviously, I don't know enough about it to know if that could really go far. But it, it's interesting that he's shooting himself in the foot again because they keep saying, you know, this is, this was the most fair election in U S history. What I'm seeing right here is that maybe it wasn't at least completely fair in terms of like no fraud, because it does show that at least there was Russian malware inside of this, inside of these departments. Right. And so if I were Trump, I would maybe say, okay, well, see, Russia was involved in this election. So it wasn't as fair as you think it was, but instead he's gone the other way. And so that to me says there's something there. And that's a, that's a good point, because, I mean, like, let's be clear, though, like we, we, we don't have any information that the Russian malware like changed votes. Right. It just right, of course, not. it just maybe they got in they got information from those sites. But we have the right. But but yeah. th those facts have not mattered at all. Trump could easily claim that, but he doesn't. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a better case than some of the stuff Rudy's been saying out there. And right, like Venezuelans or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, Hugo Chavez came back from the dead and switched my vote to Joe Biden. <laughs> I mean, you can't even get toilet paper in Venezuela, but somehow Hugo Chavez was, you know, yeah. they pulled off democracy. They pulled off the biggest <laughs> political heist in history. <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. But okay, so yeah, on, on to the other thing you said is that I agree with you that I don't know if a multi- multilateral trade agreement, or not trade agreement, but discussion over cyber terrorism would be the right solution because that still, you know, holds other countries accountable to our level. And that's just not the way it is right now. But I think at least it would draw a line and we could agree on that line, you know, because right now it's like, do we respond or, or do we not? Like I, I've seen a lot of national security experts say that this is kind of like a cyber Pearl Harbor. And I think you're right that this is the future. You know, I, I read a pretty horrible book <laughs> two years ago called The President is Missing. It's um, Patterson and Bill Clinton wrote it together. It's a fiction about Russia basically shuts down the US in a cyber attack and the president literally goes missing. And not that great of a book, but actually the plot of that with the Russians completely you know, destabilizing the US and shutting down our electrical grid, everything, that's a serious concern that actually could be possible. And you're right is that if we keep just not responding to stuff, I think Russia is just kind of poking the bear or they're stirring the fire to see how many sparks fly. And and like that's my big issue with Trump, too, is that I, I think in Moscow, they feel like there's no president who is going to tell them no. Yeah. They feel invincible, man. I mean, they're poisoning people. And in, in, like, again, broad daylight, like everyone knows 
that political opposition guys are getting poisoned by you know Putin and journalists getting poisoned, and it's like, what? No one does it. Like, what can we do? No one does anything. I I, I really think like Russia, like you said, is just consistently pushing the boundaries. It's like, what can we get away with? And 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 they're getting away with it now. Again, I don't know what the, what we're doing on like. I mean, there could be a response that the U.S. government is doing that we just don't know about, right? I imagine if you're at the top level security of like you're in the NSA or the CIA and you're counter hacking, I imagine you're not going to tell people about it. So we, you know, I don't know if we're we're doing nothing or doing something, but I certainly hope that at the highest levels of our government, they are looking into this seriously, um, and and not. And like, I'm very thankful that Trump is on the way out because it's so obvious to me that he doesn't care about this at all. He doesn't care about our national security when it comes to Russian hacking, because I think maybe if, if there's a connection or not, there at least is the association politically that he hates. Right. You know, if it's there or not, he obviously hates being in the same sentence as Russia. And I don't know why he just can't like call them out like i don't know why you can't like be like go along with your own experts your own guys and mike pompeo and bill barr even though bill barr is retiring but um <laughs> you know like it's just so i'm very thankful that biden's coming in like i don't know what he's going to do i don't know what his plan is going to be good or not but I'm, i at least have the confidence that he's going to take it seriously which is what we need yeah i mean i i i feel like especially in terms of cyber warfare and cyber espionage Biden is a 20th century president in the 21st century, like yeah. geopolitical atmosphere. But I, I think you're right. Is that it, it, to me, to me, it's probably going to be a, be a very mixed bag, the Biden presidency, but it's probably going to be good in the terms of at least letting our allies know we're back. Yeah. Because I, I feel like the Russians might've been a little bit slower to act if they knew there was a president who was going to put the hammer down. Yeah. Um, Though I'm, I, I've been recently super fascinated with Russia because I don't think the West understands what Putin wants. And, you know, like, like th this isn't just about cyber warfare, but I think it's kind of just my idea, generally speaking, of how Russia is acting right now. You know, Russia has always kind of been a kind of feudal, feudalistic state with a lot of regions, a lot of different ethnic groups that have all been kind of held together by a strong power. And to be completely honest, Putin has brought more wealth and just a better quality of life than anyone else before. So it, it is interesting to see is that I think we compare Russia sometimes as being the same as like a Germany or a France or something, you know, a very Western ally, but they're not. I mean, it's a totally different culture that is that has changed so much over the last century that I, I think we forget that. And sometimes I think that when the Soviet Union fell, there was kind of a sense of hope and pride inside of Russia in which the people were like, hey, we just defeated communism. We rejected authoritarianism and finally are willing to kind of work with the West and open democracies. And I think they assumed the world was going to welcome them in. And instead, they've kind of been cast off. They've been kind of the ugly stepchild. Yeah. And and I, I feel like Putin doesn't really want global domination. He wants respect and he wants to kind of bring back that old czarist empire. And I think a lot of Russians like that. I, I don't really think Russia is a global expansionist actor. I think they just want respect. And until a, like a pre, I think Biden could be the president. Like the problem is, is that no president in the U.S. really is willing to work with Russia in a tangible way. I mean, Obama talks about how Medvedev, or I, I can't pronounce his name, who is he was the prime minister when Putin stepped down for a little bit. Right. Obama talks about how he actually had a pretty rosy view of trying to, you know, bring Russia into the Western order. But but Putin was always this like kind of angry nationalist. And that's what I'm I just feel like we don't understand Russia. And so these hacks might keep going until until maybe they get a foot at the table. But I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know, man. I think that's a good I think you bring up a good point, though, because, you know, because we, we talk about Russia and China a lot as like the main adversaries not like full-on enemies but adversaries of the united states as far as global power but i think you're right that china is more the expansionist belt and road initiative overarching power wants to be the global hegemony whereas whereas you're probably right that i mean just based off the numbers right russia's <laughs> a third of the size of population wise as the united states you know a tenth of the size population of china um does not have the overall like 
financial assets to fund a war on the scale of China or the United States. So you're right. Like if really push to comes to shove, like we're talking big stick out World War Three. Yeah, Russia would, would lose handedly. Um, but that's you're right. So they're not going for global domination. But I think you're uh, interesting right about that cultural aspect of how, you know, there's they're definitely Russia, f like Russian first. I think that there's an, an identity that goes along with like, you know, people can be German and Italian and, it and, and French, but they do have an identity that's European. Right. There's a there's a there's at least this identity of a Western European and like what, it, what a European ideals or what that means of humanism and secularism. Right. That if you're Italian or French or German, you can all get behind. Russia, I don't think I include Russia, beat Russia or Russian pol pol uh, politicians in that same regard. I don't think Russian politicians have the same, you know, love for democracy and humanism and secularism as like, you know, other European nations. They, 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 half of Russia isn't even in Europe. So, <laughs> you know, you, like, I think you're right that they're, they are not like, even though the Soviet Union fell, they were never brought fully into the fold of the West. And obviously, we're seeing that play out. I mean, you know, still there's sanctions on Russia for certain things because of the annex Crimea, right? They, they have been kind of like the bad kid in the back of the class. And um, <laughs> the bad kid in the back of the class just threw a paper plane at the good kid, the good blonde American kid in the front. So, you know, that's a stupid allegory. But I, I, I think I do think you're right that understanding the motives behind Russia and understanding who, who Putin is and what he'd be willing to do, then then plays along and kind of lends credence to the idea that Russian did do this hack and would do this. And we need to kind of address it and, and, and not downplay it. Do you do you think the the Trump administration had any idea about at least the scope of the Russian ability to hack? I'm trying to phrase it in a way where I don't think they would have known about this hack because no one knew. But yeah, do you think that think they so. knew about the scope of the ability to? Well, considering that, I mean, within the Trump administration, I mean, who knows, man? It sounds like they don't even talk to each other. <laughs> I, from what I saw, though, is that we knew, have known since 2016 that there is an, an active Russian effort to influence the information and our social media that, that guides public opinion, Right. Uh, that's that's very different than like vote changing. I, I no one no one in their right mind was arguing that Russia changed votes in 2016, but they did influence information that was leaked. They did influence social media posts that influenced people's opinions, right? And so we we saw that Russia had been actively trying to manipulate our governments for years, and they put bills in front of the Senate to increase our funding in these areas to look into what exactly like the Russian troll farms to define the extent at which they manipulated social media and Mitch McConnell killed those bills. So I think it's, it's dis like, I think it's ridiculous that like, you know, if, 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 if Republicans now start acting like, Oh, we had no idea that Russia would do this. We didn't expect this, right? Like this particular hack. Sure. But you have to know that they've been doing like they've been attacking us for years and, 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 and there's been real efforts to make legislation to go against it. And they've been dead on arrival in the Senate. Yeah, it kind of seems like we left the car running with the keys in it. Like, yeah. You know, we we uh, like I don't really think Mitch McConnell would like champion, you know, Russian interference. But there is there is a lack of willingness to do anything. And I, I am curious about really what is the next step, you know, um, because like I almost feel like just to be some somewhat optimistic for a certain like just second is that this is actually anti characteristic. I don't know if that's a word, but whatever. Uncharacteristic. I, uncharacteristic. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> I, um, but I, I feel like. I feel like Russia has been more interested in letting us eat ourselves in yes. terms of like using democracy against us, right? And that's what we saw in 2016. Hundred percent. And 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 this this hack seems uncharacteristic of that. Like, so I'm curious if it was them just testing the water, just to see what they can get away with, and maybe they actually didn't really have any nefarious intentions. It was just to see. Like to me, that seems like something Putin would do because he's not an idiot. He's actually probably one of the smartest world leaders out there. Sure. Um, and I don't think he would want to do something to actually detrimentally 
put his country into conflict because on a numbers game, Russia is doing better than it's ever done in history, or at least the history over the last like couple hundred years. So I don't know if he wants to change that. He's not as popular as he used to be, but he still is relatively popular at home, especially when he gets rid of the the people, you know, gets rid of the ones who don't don't like him and all that. But I mean, but yeah, I don't know. I, I see what you're saying. Like, he's calculated, but he's made mistakes, right? He makes mistakes. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, he didn't end up actually poisoning that one guy, Nevel, Nevenemy, Nevevenemy. I, I, I can't pronounce it. Oh, yeah, names. Alex. That's yeah. Right. I just know his name's Alex. Right, Alex, <laughs> right. Well, you know, he tried to poison him, and, and it failed, and he survived, and the guy has now found evidence of his poisoning, and, you know, connect dots is not hard. Um, and so, you know, not, not all of Putin's pens, you know, come to fruition. Um, I think, I see what you're saying, though, that, like, um, you know, again, we don't know exactly what they targeted. Could have been that risk versus reward. You know, that could have been a calculated risk. Like, well, we risk getting caught, and you know, if we get caught, maybe there's more sanctions against us, right? If you, you know, Biden may have imposed more sanctions against Russia. But what if what they got was worth it? Or what if they say, hey, you know, even if we get, like, first of all, we could not get caught, and then we get this, we get the goods, and we're out. And if we do get caught, it's an it's an international embarrassment to the United States government, and that's worth whatever, you know, whatever sanctions or not, whatever we we come up with against them. You know, again, like it could be a calculated risk thing. Like if we, I have no idea what they actually got out of it, but I'm sure they got something because they they hacked like pretty much every large government institution and got everything. Um, I, yeah. I, I I think, you know. <laughs> I think it is at the level of like, look, I'm not going to like, we shouldn't declare war or anything, but man, we really need to get the top cybersecurity experts and figure out what's going on and figure out how to not just stop them from attacking us, but make them not even think about it anymore. Make them wish they never did. Like, I, I, I hate to sound war hawkish because I don't, I certainly don't want violence, but like, this just can't happen. This kind of, this kind of hack just should not happen. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and the last thing I'll say, because I, I won't get into it, but on, on what you said, I, I think you're right. And, you know, the U.S. did deploy a virus against Iran yes. um, with the goal of, you know, setting back its nuclear program. Right. And it, it actually seemed to work. That was against kind of our deterrence method that we've used, you know, in most diplomacy since, I would say, the end of World War II. Um, and it worked. And I, I think you're right, is that we do need to at least send a message, because if you if you stop sending messages like we have, and that wasn't just Trump, the, you know, the Obama administration did not do a good job of holding down Russia either. No, they didn't. And no, not at all. <laughs> but but I, I do think that, you know, we did show Iran that if we think you're a threat, we can do this. And I think we should probably do the same. And like you, I, I'm not a war hawk. I, I actually think that the U.S. should kind of stay away from Russia usually. Because our interests and cultures are just so different. Uh, but yeah, I I think we do need to show them that hey, if you do this again, we have better, <laughs> we have a better infrastructure to carry this out than you do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so uh, it's certainly um, it's certainly troubling. It's certainly troubling, and and it's also kind of scary just because I don't know so much, right? Because I think I think ninety nine point nine percent of the world is illiterate in this topic. That's why it can be very confusing and, and, and maybe a little bit scary. Hopefully we shed some light on exactly what's happening, though we are not, like we said, we are not cybersecurity experts, um, but we are going off what we've heard from experts, going off what's in the news, and that's the best we can do. Um, hopefully, again, that kind of brought you know some, some kind of understanding as to what this hack is, why it's happening, and who's behind it, why this is different than just like, you know, oh, someone hacked my Best Buy. Um, all right. Is there anything else you wanted to get before we get out of here? No, I I would reiterate what you just said. I yeah. I mean, sometimes you know, if even if you're not a cyber expert, it takes people who can kind of look at the macro dynamics of the world, and I think it, I think both of us can at least do that. So, you know, we can we can at least point fingers and maybe have some ideas, and that's usually what we do. So, as always, uh, you guys have a great Christmas. Um, it's it's going to be different this year, but just stay safe and positive, and you know, hopefully around the corner there's there's some light. So you can always find us on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, YouTube, iTunes, uh, third-party sites here on Twitch. Hi, Twitch. We had some interesting comments we, we didn't really have time to oh, get yeah, to shoot. because I didn't really understand them. But, um, yeah, 